Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank Broad Bay Sailing Association for having me. For, in particular, I want to thank Stephanie Sweeney, um, the Commodore of DBSA, Butch Patterson and Randy Goodman, the DBSA Training Committee. Um, I want to talk a little bit about DBSA before we get going because they've been you know, a huge help to getting this whole thing put together. Initially, we had planned on having this chat or this seminar in person, um, obviously with everything going on. We had to adjust our plans, so we decided to have it in this webinar format. Um, for me, this is my first time giving one of these webinars, so hopefully you guys can bear with me as I work through it, and I think um, we can still give a really good presentation through this format. BBSA is a nonprofit sailing club um, located down here on the southern Chesapeake Bay, kind of the Hampton Roads, Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. This area is very near and dear to my heart because I actually went to school down here. I went to college, and then my parents actually moved down here. So, and currently I'm actually giving this presentation from down in the Norfolk area because I am uh, self-quarantining at the condo. So it should be um, a really fun time down here. They host regattas such as the Cape Henry Cup, the Neptune Atlantic Regatta, the Broad Bay Championship for the Bold Mariner Cup, Willoughby's Hot Buttered Rum Race, Willoughby's Memorial Regatta, Hobie Fleet's version 2.19 race, and their biggest race of the year is the three-day Cape Charles Cup, which is hosted in August and typically has up to 80 or 90 big boats from cruisers to racers and everything in between. If you have any questions regarding BVSA, just send me an email and I'd be happy to get you in contact with the organizers. Um, a little bit about me. I, uh, I joined North about six months ago or so, but I've been in sail making for about five years. Started in college and then worked after that. Um, in a sail making role. I've uh, won a couple of offshore races and primarily I focus on, I guess I don't really have a focus. I do, you know, one design, I do cruising, I do big boat racing. I kind of do everything in terms of, of what North, you know, needs me to do. And I try and be a jack of all trades when I can. Um, if you are wondering, I was born before the movie. So um, the movie copied me, I get that a lot. So we'll just clear that up right out the gate and uh, we'll go ahead. So we've kind of divided this presentation into a three-part presentation where we're going to talk about where we came from in terms, of, in terms of the downwind sailing technology and the history of it. We're going to move into where we are today. So if you bear with me, I'll be going into a little bit of some higher end sail technology, especially at the Grand Prix level, which might not seem relatable, but then at the end, the part three will be how does this apply back to me? And then following that, we'll take some questions in the chat room. So moving forward, part one, where we came from. We're gonna take a really big step back and go into, you know, way back in time to the square riggers and the jump riggers just for a point of reference. Um, these boats, I like to say they use the barn door approach where essentially they put as much sail area up as possible and presented as much sail area to the wind and then rode it downwind with big long water lines to go fast. Um, now, obviously, we've come a long way since then, but I think it's just interesting to take a look at those types of rigs and then see, you know, as we move forward, how it relates to the boats that we, we have today. Um, going into like the early symmetrical spinnaker days, so we've taken a big leap in time forward, but this is kind of where I'm going to begin because in terms of research, I wasn't alive for a lot of that stuff. So I had to start kind of where, you know, there was some good information. And first off, I started with some of my elder statesmen in the office to ask them about sail making back in the early 70s and 80s. So essentially, when they first started out, they were making these spinnakers by hand. So they're, they're called a symmetrical spinnaker because from side to side, they're in theory both even, although back in the day, everything was hand cut. So there was a bit of room for error, but now as computer aided design has come in, these sails have gotten a lot better. Um, in terms of the panel layouts, they actually started out as a crosscut panel layout, and then they kind of morphed, if you look at this photo right here, into this radial head and radial clue pattern, but they still had these crosscut panels in the middle to give it shape. Um, the early 12 meters had these, and obviously we're still using these spinnakers today, but they've been a long, around for a long time, so these shapes have come a long way. Um, one interesting thing to note is that the nylon back in the day was not very consistent from lot to lot and from batch, batch to batch. Um, and talking to my, uh, my you know, fellow colleagues, they were telling me that 
you know, you would get a roll of nylon that would have a big dip in the middle of it. Sometimes it'd be really tight around the outside. So there was a lot of waste when it came to making these sales. And they took a really, really long time with, you know, three or four guys on the floor working full time, hand cutting these panels and making these things come out, you know, hopefully in theory correctly. And if not, it's time to break out the scissors and do a big recut. I would be remiss if I didn't move forward a little bit in time talking about the IOR era, another era in which I, you know, wasn't alive for, but was able to chat with the guys a bit about. And they said um, it was, you know, some of the wildest rides down when they've had, not necessarily because of the speed, because the boats were really only maxing out at hull speed, but because of how unstable these boats were, especially in the stern. And that's where these sails called bloopers came along, which are used in concert with symmetrical kites. And the interesting thing about a blooper was that you actually trim the sail, you would set the tack line and the clue or the sheet, if you will, kind of stagnant. And you actually trim the sail with the halyard. So as you heel to leeward, um, if you heel to the blooper side too much, you would ease the halyard a bit to let the wind spill off of it. And if you heel the other way, you would actually have to trim it back in some. To me, you know, not having had to do this, but looking at it, it looks extremely complicated to go only nine knots downwind. So I found this fun video when looking for IOR boats to show you guys to just see, you know, what the ride was like downwind. So here we have coming out of a jibe. They don't have a blooper out in these shots, but these were the, you know, the same types of IOR boats that were a little pinched in the stern that weren't necessarily the most stable downwind. And as you can see, if you got into a bit of trouble, they were pretty hard to bring back. Like here, there's a boat completely on its ear. Um, they're gonna probably have a long downwind leg at this point. Going forward um, here in a second, man, they are really over. Uh, you'll see there that boat that's coming by to windward as they roll out. The big thing with these boats is they, instead of really getting up on a plane and going fast, we're like right there, they just dig these massive holes in the water and they don't really go much faster. So you would end up going downwind with the boats, you know, just the water a couple inches up to the water line. And the other issue these boats had, especially in breeze, is that since you're only going eight or nine knots, the apparent wind that the rig feels was still pretty substantial. So even if, you know, if it's blowing 25 knots, you only take nine knots of wind off the rig. It, the rig's seeing a lot of force. So that's when you end up with having these rigs, you know, rig failures and guys going over the side and these big wipeouts. Then moving along to the late 80s, early 90s, um, we get kind of into the early asymmetrical um, spinnakers. Obviously, like in places like Australia, they had been dealing with asymmetricals for a very long time, but it really wasn't until boats like the, you know, the Melges 24 and the J105 made it into the U.S. that the sport boats and the asymmetrical kites as racing boats really took hold. Um, there in that picture is a Melges 30, um, one of the early sport boats. And the, the one thing to note with this kite is it is absolutely incredibly big. And, and if you look at it from top to bottom, it has a lot of shape in it as well. And one thing that's happened over the last, you know, five, 10 years is actually as the boats have gotten faster, they need less stale area to get downwind. So that would be a very, very deep kite that probably wouldn't be a, a modern design that we would see today. The other thing that was going on for the cruising front um, and around the same time period is people were making what they called cruising genikers, where essentially they would take a symmetrical kite shorten one side of it just a little bit so it had a leech um, and then it would you know that was their modern asymmetrical um, for cruising which you know thank god they've come a long way since that a quick lesson in bmg to talk about asymmetrical kites um, bmg stands for velocity made good and what that means is instead of you know on sailboats we have to sail angles to the wind because we can't sail directly into the wind but then downwind with these asymmetrical boats, they do the same thing where instead of tacking upwind, they're jiving downwind. And what you'll notice is that the faster a boat is and when it gets up on a plane, they actually sail quicker straight downwind by sailing these very broad angles because the boat speed picks up. 
Um, boats are very different in terms of this. So if you have a boat that's like a non-planing boat with an asymmetrical kite, it's gonna still sail pretty deep on those symmetrical angles. But if you have a sport boat, like a Melges 32 or something like that, you're gonna sail you know, a lot closer to the wind because as soon as you heat up, you start going fast and then the, the VMG picks up pretty quickly after that. So here's just an example of jiving downwind um, and getting down towards, you know, say a leeward mark where a boat going straight downwind might be doing, you know, six or seven knots, but say this ASIM boat is sailing 10 or 11 knots at an angle, it's actually making a better velocity to the mark. So where we are today, we have improved asymmetrical spinnakers. So one, we have much better sailcloth. Nylons have come a long way and batch to batch, you can hardly tell a difference between any of the sailcloth. And that includes colors as well. There used to be kind of this train of thought that um, you, if you had a true racing spinnaker, it had to be all the same color so that it stretched evenly now with the advances in weaving technology, the, the batches batch to batch are much more consistent and you can actually have a colored spinnaker that still stretches very evenly and looks really smooth at the end of the day. Um, we have these sales called code zeros, which I'll get into a little bit later. And then the other big thing that's happened is most boats, especially in the last five to seven years, now have non-overlapping rigs. So gone are the days where we would have masts pretty far forward in the boat and big 155 Genoa's or even 165 Genoa's. Now all of the boats are tending to have a bit of a taller rig. The masts are a little further aft in the boat and then they're having these four triangles which they fill up with either these asymmetrical sails or non-overlapping jibs. And what that's also allowed is that having these big four triangles, especially with a bow spread included, you can fly multiple head sails while off the wind and increase your, um, increase your speed by having a second slot that cleans up the airflow behind the main. And then finally, I'm gonna get into a bit of sail handling that's come down from the Grand Prix level. So here is an example of a modern asymmetrical spinnaker. You can see it's you know, very smooth in comparison to the old symmetrical spinnakers that we were showing earlier. Um, this one's still a little bit on the bigger side because this boat is, it's kind of a half planing boat. It planes in a lot of wind, but it still needs that sail area to get down in the non-planing conditions. One cool thing that we can do now as well with asymmetricals is if you want a sail that you can maybe push up range a bit, we can split the weights and have a heavier material around the tack and off the luff to allow you to take a sail, um, you know, up the wind range until you cross over to your next spinnaker. One thing to think about is, you know, when you're racing, you have these in, uh, gaps in your inventory that you need to fill when going downwind. Like in a perfect world, everyone on this, you know, on this planet would buy all of those sails for me and they would cover their entire downwind wind range. But we're restrained by things like budgets and um, unfortunately the real world. So it's important to talk to your sail maker about finding um, the correct a, a sail for you going downwind. So one way to think about it is a sails are just like your Genoa's or your jibs going upwind. There are different sizes and shapes for different wind ranges. So this is a spinnaker coating chart. And this explains how spinnakers are named based off of what their purpose is. So for example, all of the odd number sails, those are gonna be your reaching sails. All of the even number ones are gonna be more of your runners. And then the two exceptions on that chart are the code zero, which is a really flat light air reaching sail, close winded and then an A15, which is actually a flat kind of hybrid runner reacher that you can use in light air. Just like say, for example, on a Genoa boat, you'd have your 155, your 135, and your blade, and they're all different shapes. It's the same sort of deal. So when you look at an A1 or an A2, those are gonna be a lot bigger than say an A5 or an A3, because those sails have to get closer to the wind, so they can't be as full or as big to allow the, the boat to sail that close to the wind. Here's a video of a modern asymmetrical boat going downwind and you'll really be able to see that by heating up a little bit and getting the boat out of the water. Now, they're not sailing dead downwind, but they are sailing probably four or five knots faster than if they tried to sail dead downwind. And at the end of the day, when you average that vector out, they're getting downwind in a hurry. Um, I do understand not all of us have a Club Swan 36, but 
This is just a good example to get us going down that track, and then we'll relate it back to your boat at the end of the presentation. So code zero, that's our first sale that we talked about on that chart back there. And there's been a lot of talk about these, you know, lately and over the last 10 years. Um, there seems to be a bit of a misconception because it covers kind of a wide range of what the sale can be. But when I talk about a code zero, um, we're generally talking about a sale that has what's called a 75% mid girth. And the reason they do this is because under rules like PHRF, spinnakers are um, between 75 and 100% of the mid girth. So what a mid girth is, is, if you look at my mouse for a second, this yellow band right here is the halfway point of the sale. And what the 75% rule means is that this measurement needs to at least be 75% of the foot length, so this measurement. And what that allowed them to do was to make, for these non-overlapping rigs, it allowed them to make these sails that can go really close-winded and act like a Genoa, but still measure like a spinnaker and take no penalty. Since then, um, the rules guys have sort of catched the, caught on to it. So under rules like ORC and the most recent rule change this year, they now measure any sail with a mid-girth between 50 and up to 85%, and you have to measure it in. Um, one thing to note as well is when you think about a modern non-overlapping rig, they have these big mains and these really small jibs, and as soon as you crack off onto a reach, you're losing a lot of power. So even cruising boats these days tend to have, you know, a main, a small jib, and then they do also have the little bowsprit a lot of the time. And these sails are great for boats like that because you really, really have to have them as soon as you get off the wind if you want to do any sort of sailing, especially in under 10 knots. Here's a nice video of a code zero in action. I know we all have 100 footers laying in our backyard, so this will be good for you guys to relate to here. So there's a really good example of the mass being far aft in the boat and having these large four triangles. So there they have a main, and they actually have multiple head sails inside of that code zero, but that sail is just absolutely imperative for them to have in any sort of conditions under 10 knots because they need all the horsepower they can get when they're cracked off. So that brings me to the next topic of multiple head sails. So um, stay sails have been around for a really long time. Um, stay sails are you know, not, not necessarily the newest technology in the world, but what's happened is with the advent of things like continuous line furlers and cabled sails, they've been able to bring all of these sails into the four triangle really easily and efficiently with a small crew. So all of those sails that you see in that photo right there are able to furl up with one person and then bring a couple guys on deck and drop it easily into a bag. So gone are the days of having to bring, you know, 10, 12 guys up on the deck and flake a sail into a bag. Now all of these offshore boat, you know, Volvo Ocean Racers, 100 foot Grand Prix boats and these shorthanded Amoka boats all have these sails on furlers to make things much easier to handle as a shorthanded crew. And right there is a nice photo as well where you can see they have two head sails out and they only need to bring two guys up to the front of the boat to carry that sail out. And you can see it's rolled up like a sausage right here and then they'll hoist it and then it'll unfurl just like you'll have on a standard cruising furling general, which is really, really nice to have. And this is my favorite video that I have from the last Volvo Ocean Race. This is a drone shot of a boat going downwind and pretty big breeze. And I think the big thing to note here is while it does look out of control, there's no need for a blooper. There's no guys going over the side. And the boat's relatively stable side to side. And obviously, they're going really, really fast. As the drone swings around, you'll see the multiple head sails inside of it. And what that's doing, is it's creating multiple slots to drive the boat forward and it's cleaning up the airflow, you know, behind the main and then in front of the, or behind the code zero as well. Right there is a nice shot where you can see all three, all on furlers, all easily if they need to be furled, dropped to the deck and stowed away, or just furled for a moment until the boat gets back under control. 
what's interesting with all of these boats now is really there's only one sail that actually goes on the headsail where back in the day you would have you know say a 165 a 135 and a 100 percent jib now all of the sails are inside the four triangle and generally stop at the shrouds and so instead of having a bigger overlap the tack point just moves closer to the mast so your j1 or your jib would go on the head stay, but then your J2 and your J3 would move inside of that sail right on the deck as opposed to overlapping further past the shrouds. And all those sails, instead of having their own stay that you would hang to, they have the stay sewn into the luff of the sail and it just gets hoisted up on these furlers. So as you can see, it's very fast. Um, in theory, it's, you know, easy to use. Obviously, every system has its downfall, but it does take, you know, add some simplicity. And then there's the final drone catch to pop it all off. So I was talking a bit earlier about cabled sails. The one issue that they had with the cabled sails is that to get a tight enough luff to sail these code zeros really tight to the wind, they were putting enormous loads on both the rig and the bowsprit. So uh, about three or four years ago, they started experimenting with um, cableless sails. So sails with no cable in the luff where the, the actual luff of the sail would take the load when furling. And north we have our helix line, which essentially means the sail is sharing the load of that cable with the actual sail without having to have a cable at all. And what that does for you is the sail shape is a lot better because they're able to project the luff forward and get it really close to the wind. And there's not as much material that we have to put in the back end of the leech to reach that mid girth rule. Most of the area stands forward. And then finally, when you're storing the sail, one, it's a lot less heavy having a really, really long cable in there. And two, it can fold down into the bag a lot easier. So here's an interesting shot of the difference between a cabled code zero and our helix sail. You can see on this left shot over here, this was that luff sag that I was talking about earlier. To take that out, you would have to put an enormous amount of load on that halyard and the tack line to get that to come out. Here, the tack line's actually eased a bit more, but due to the sail shape and the design of the sail, it actually stands closer to the wind. And then same over here, you can see you have some inverted luff sag here, but over here, you have the luff projecting forward. And that's where the magic of these sails really happen is that you're able to sail really, really close to the wind. But the other advantage is when you ease that tack line off, you can actually go broader off the wind as well with that same sail, which means it's increasing the ranges and the overlap between your sails. And it's just less load on the rig and the boat overall. So now, as we move into part three, how does this apply to me? Um, luckily, you know, all of this technology does make its way down to the club racer and the cruising level. You know, I think right now we take a look at the America's Cup and it's hard to imagine a lot of that technology maybe making it down to, you know, every boat that you walk down the dock here at your yacht club. But I think the, the Grand Prix level and the 100 footers and the Amoka boats and the Volvo boats, that technology is making it down to the club level and the cruising level because the sail handling and the sail shapes have gotten so much better. It's making it back down and making sailing hopefully easier for everyone else. So I think one thing to think about when you're making that decision about whether you want to sail, you know, symmetric or spinnaker or non-spinnaker is, you know, back in the day or with symmetrical kites, you have to have, you know, relatively trained crew. You got to have seven or eight guys on some boats, you know, boats over 35 to 40 feet to get that boat around the course on a Wednesday night, which we might necessarily, you know, we want to kind of chill on a Wednesday night. But if you think about using maybe an ASIM off the bow, it's pretty easy to hoist. You can jibe it pretty easily as well. It makes it easier to take a crew of say three or four or five that you, you know, might not have the most experience, but have sailed a bit before and you can still use a spinnaker on a Wednesday night or on a distance race. Um, so right there is a J105 and you can see it has a bow sprit. But the other thing I wanna get into is you don't even need to have a pole to do a lot of these sails. They can be tacked right to the bow and still jibed outside just like you would jive any other sail. Um, we have multiple headsails now on cables and we have trade wind rigs that furl. So I'll move into all this here in a second. So sail handling. 
that is one of the biggest advancements that have moved down to us. So I was talking a lot about that video with the, the sales all on the furlers. That technology is available to the everyday user. Um, they're a bit of an investment up front, but in terms of making the sales easier to handle or using a Spinnaker or a Code Zero more often, it makes a world of difference. And I think it's entirely worth the investment. And the good thing is older sales that you have can also be fitted you know, like a spinnaker can be added on to a, a top-down furler, for example, or, you know, code zero should, can get added to a cable and then added to a furler. The other cool thing that's trickled down um, is with the, if you look at this picture right here, he has an inner jib on a furler. So for the cruising guys, I've actually built a couple sails where instead of adding a whole inner stay um, so that the cruiser could have an, a staysail or a storm jib, We've just had a halyard and a two to one pack line and we've made a Dacron sail or a cruising sail with a cable inside of it and a UV cover that he can leave up either all the time if he wanted to, or say he wants to clear out some room on his floor deck, he can just lower the sail right into a bag and snake the entire stay and sail out of the way at whatever he wants to do and whatever his choosing is. Um, snuffers have made it down. So snuffers were, were getting used on a lot of the shorthanded boats. Now the boats are going so fast that they don't necessarily have spinnakers, but snuffers have come on and they've been along, you know, out for a really long time as well. But another great option, if you're on the fence about using a spinnaker or an asymmetrical spinnaker, it's a great way to, you know, hopefully guarantee you get the sail into the boat every time without damaging any people or crew. And that's the continuous line furler again. So what you can see, the difference between that and if people are familiar with their normal furling um, head stay is there's no wraps around the drum. This line is spliced together end to end and it's just going to run back to your cockpit. And if you want to furl the sail up, you just pull on the correct side of it and it furls right up um, and then it can be removed away. So this cable, if you look at this cable right here, it's soft so that it can snake down to say a sail bag, but if you try and twist it with your hands, it won't twist it at all. And that's what we're using on inner jibs. Um, they are getting used on code zeros and things like that, but on the code zeros, people are trying to steer away from these to um, sails that don't need the cable at all. So cruising and racing A sails. Um, most Cruising boats and racing boats that come out now, I would say 98% of them all are built with asymmetrical sails as opposed to the symmetrical kites. And that makes it, you know, in theory, way easier to, to get around the course with less people. Um, and you can see here, that's tacked right to the bow. So there's not even a bow spray on that boat. And they're still sailing around with these ASIM sails that make it easier on the big crews. And here's another shot of it, this shot on the left, is actually a Hobie 33 that just won the Puerto Vallarta race. And they were sailing ASIMs tacked right off the bow, even though there was no bow spread on the boat. And they were extremely fast, both in the reaching and the running conditions. Here is an example on the right of a cruising boat with an asymmetrical spinnaker, no bow spread, and he just has a block up here for his tack line. And then the sail actually tacks around his furled up Genoa. Um, so another easy way for a cruising boat or, you know, say a boat that wants to get into a spinnaker racing can try something like that out first and then move forward as the crew gets more advanced into, into either a sprit or go back to a symmetrical kite. So the code zeros. One thing that's cool that's trickled down is that we've now made them into a cruising sail as well. So a lot of these cruising boats like right here have this bow sprit where you can have a head sole, either a spinnaker or a code zero to handle all of your downwind work. And we can even add UV covers now to these sails. So we can add a light UV cover. I wouldn't recommend leaving them up all the time like you would say your normal furling Genoa, but if you want to put it up at the dock before you go out on a Friday and take it down on a Sunday when you get back, um, it's a great option for that. And it takes a lot of the stress and the headache out of lugging a big heavy sail up on deck and, and hoisting it up. Um, multiple head soles. So that technology has made it back as well. Here's a boat that has a non-overlapping jib like we talked about on all these modern cruising boats. And then he's got a reaching sail that he leaves out here as well that'll handle his reaching and his off-wind work. And here's a boat with a soft inner staysail that he can, if he wanted to, he could totally flake this sail away into a bag. But when he wants to use it, he tensions it up. It becomes his new stay, his new inner stay and he can furl it and use it as, as his leisure. 
And then finally, we've taken the, you know, the traditional trade wind rig and added them over to um, continuous furlers as well. So this is a cool trade wind sail that we have out where you can, you know, either have both sails flying out directly downwind back to that really old school concept we talked about at the beginning of the chat. Um, but when you want to furl it up, you just have a continuous line furler on the bottom and furl it away and drop it right to the deck. Um, so this is the part we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, Louisa, if you want to go ahead and, and start firing away. Um, yeah, so the chat is open. If you have questions, you can uh, go ahead and put them there and then uh, Austin can answer them. If not, Austin's a genius so far and explained everything really well. <laughs> is there any other um, tips or tricks that you want to add right now, Austin? Um, I'd say mainly the, the crux of this talk is if you if you're considering getting an off wind sail, you know, a lot of cruisers that I talk to and a lot of guys who are questionable about racing are always concerned with, um, you know, the daunting task of either flying a spinnaker or flying, a, you know, a, a sail that you have to go up on the four deck to use. With technology, with these new, you know, these new furlers and these new snuffers, um, and just a little bit of practice and maybe one lesson from your sail maker, you can take these sails and get them up, get them down you know, in a timely manner, in a safe manner, and you're going to really love the performance of your boat um, after putting one of these sails up. I think, especially if you have a cruising boat that's come out in the last five to 10 years with a non-overlapping rig, you're really going to want one of, you know, either a cruising asymmetrical or a code zero to handle that off the wind reaching work. And then for the average, um, you know, PHRF racer, a lot of boats would benefit from maybe going to an asymmetrical sail. Um, it might not necessarily be the most efficient when compared to a symmetrical sail going straight down wind, but you do pick up a lot in terms of the sail handling and the crew work. You might make that time up anyway, and it's just a lot bigger, a lot less of a headache when you are going downwind. All right, Austin, we've got one question here asking um, about sail trim for any of these downwind sails. Are you able to, to give a quick you know, yeah. Three tips. So, so obviously the with with a sails, if you're familiar with symmetrical sails or coming from a symmetrical background, they do trim in a very similar way and where you're you're watching the curl or the luff of the sail and you're easing until you see that curl and then trimming back in. Um, one thing to note is when you get to the faster boats, the boats that are really sailing either planing or or higher apparent wind angles. Um, you're not going to do as much of the ease in the trim. You're going to more lock the, the sail trim in and let the driver sail to it. Um, code zeros trim somewhere in the middle of that where they do like, if you're really racing, you want to keep them as eased as possible to let them really work for themselves. But if you're out cruising and you roll your cruising code zero out, I would just ease it out until it starts to luff a little bit and then maybe give it a couple lines on the winch and then and lock your autopilot in and let it rip. Alrighty, well, I think that is all the time that we have for tonight. Oh, hang on, we got a couple more questions. How is a boat uh, PHR rating affected for code zero and asymmetrical spinnakers? So if you're already a boat rated for asymmetrical spinnakers, a code zero would be no penalty. Um, I know PHRF in different areas treat, the, um, treat if you're going to ASIMs differently. Um, in our area, you can, and I believe this is correct, based off the newest rule, as long as the spinnaker is based off of your current J, so your current four triangle, you shouldn't take a penalty by switching over to ASMs. I think if you run both, there is a bit of a penalty, but just tacking it to the bow, I think they're trying to actually encourage these uses of these sails to try and get more people into spinnaker racing and just to make it easier overall for the crews. And ORC, Say, if, you know, on the northern part of the bay here, we have, there's using a lot of ORC now. You would have to measure a 75% sail in, or even if you have something less than that, you'd have to measure it in, and there would be some sort of rating hit for that. All right. Um, also, recommendations on sailing downwind on an old beach cat without a kite. Uh, on an old beach cat without a kite. So... The beauty of a beach cat is it's going to be, you're going to be on the faster side. So you're going to still have to be sailing angles. I think I wouldn't commit to going dead downwind in a beach cat if you're, um, 
if you only have a main and a jib. I would still sail that kind of that chart that we showed earlier where you're sailing angles with the main and the jib jiving back and forth. If you have a bow sprit, you could do an asymmetrical spinnaker relatively easily. Um, but a lot of the beach cats without the bow sprits, you have to find that kind of the range of where you can sail, keep the boat speed up, but not get too deep because then it gets pretty hairy where you can bury the bows downwind on a beach cat. All right, and one last question is, any thoughts on adding a bow sprit to a boat that doesn't have one? Yeah, so there's a lot of cool rigs out there now in terms of um, bow sprits. There's a couple of manufacturers that make kits that can either bolt on and off um, to the bow. Uh, if you email me, I can definitely send you some links uh, to, those, to those places. I think if you're just getting into it, you know, you can easily get away with not having one, but if you are going to do it, you know, in a racing fashion, adding them is really easy. You can even do it where you only have to bolt in two brackets and, and the pole can clip in and out. Um, so it's definitely something if you're going to try and tackle it, you want to either talk to a rigger or a sailmaker, preferably both, to make sure you're getting the right equipment and that your sails are going to match up with that bow sprit. Great answer. Okay, one very last one. For a layman, what wind speed would be the limit to launch a spinnaker without risk? Uh, that's very dependent on the crew and the boat. So boats that go faster downwind, um, the beauty of that is that when you are going faster, you're taking wind off the rig by your boat speed. So if you're going you know, 12, 13 knots downwind, and it's blowing 20 and you're taking a lot of that load off the rig. But if you're a novice crew, um, I would probably put the kite up. And if it's my first week or my first month practicing with the kite, I would probably start thinking about taking it down to maybe 12 to 14 knots until you get more experience. There are ways to take these kites down and a lot of wind really safely. And if you email me after, I can, I'm happy to share those, those thoughts. There's things called letterbox drops. Um, and other ways to, to make the tack fly away from the boat safely and get, and get the sail into the boat. Um, it just takes practice, I think. All right, well, thank you, Austin, and thank you for everyone joining us. We hope you have a great evening. Thank you, guys. Um, here is my email. If you guys have any questions, just austin.powers at northsales.com. Have a great afternoon, or great evening, and hopefully we all get through this really, really soon, and we're out back sailing and, and talking about spinnakers and doing the real thing.